This is PediaCast. C-M-E. Welcome to PediaCast, C-M-E, a pediatric podcast for providers. And now, direct from the campus of Nationwide Children's, here is your host, Dr. Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to PediaCast CME. It's a continuing medical education podcast for healthcare providers. I'm Dr. Mike, coming to you from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. It's episode 71 for February 14th, 2022. We're calling this one Food Allergy Update. I want to welcome all of you to the program. And I also want to wish all of you a very happy Valentine's Day. It is February 14th, after all. We have another continuing medical education activity for you this week as we consider the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of food allergies. And we're calling this an update because we have covered food allergies before, uh, back in 2016. However, the CME credit for that episode has expired. Um, Our our credit expires after three years uh, in terms of claiming Category 1 CME credit for listening to the episode. Uh, The episode is still in the feed, so you can take a listen. Uh, You just can't claim CME credit for it anymore. And even beside that fact, uh, it really is time to revisit the topic because some things have changed since 2016. Uh, First, we have a new food allergy treatment center at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and the director of that center will be joining us. And we also have a clearer picture regarding the role of oral immunotherapy in food allergy treatment. So we will discuss that in detail as well. Uh, Back in 2016, we said that oral immunotherapy was uh, up and coming, something that we may be hearing about more in the future. Well, the future is here. Uh, Oral immunotherapy is in the here and now. And so we're definitely going to cover that in way more detail uh, than we did back in 2016. Uh, Also, we have more experience with the introduction of peanut products to infants, uh, which as a concept was also an infant back in 2016. Uh, That concept has grown up to be a first grader and uh, at least in my silly analogy. So we will update our recommendations, uh, see if they've changed at all uh, compared to back in 2016 as to what our best practices for introducing uh, peanut protein uh, to infants. Uh, We'll also review the basics of food allergies, since we are a full-service podcast, Uh, those mediated by IgE and mast cells and basophils, and those mediated by other non-IgE mechanisms of the immune system. Uh, We'll explore the symptoms of both of those types of food allergies, along with uh, when is it anaphylaxis? When do you call an allergic reaction to food anaphylaxis? And if it is anaphylaxis, how is that treated? And what's the first thing that parents and doctors should do when anaphylaxis uh, is considered, and then uh, what subsequent things should be done. Stay tuned to find out. We'll also cover uh, the age-old battle of diphenhydramine versus the newer antihistamine medicines like cetirizine uh, as we consider the battle of the best and the safest and most effective uh, antihistamine medicines that we can choose for our patients. We'll ask the question, are food allergies on the rise? And if so, why is that exactly? And can we reverse that trend? We'll also consider the prevention of food allergies. So lots coming your way. Our guest is a longtime friend of this podcast, Dr. David Stukas. Uh, who is not only a pediatric allergist and director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center at Nationwide Children's, but also host of the official podcast from the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology. It's a program called Conversations from the World of Allergy, and uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Stukas uh, about that podcast uh, when we get him uh, connected to the studio. Uh, before we do that, though, let's cover our usual reminders. Don't forget you can find PediaCast CME wherever podcasts are found. We're in the Apple and Google Podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. If you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe to our show so you don't miss an episode. Also, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts so that others who come along looking for free continuing medical education credit will know what to expect. Uh, Speaking of educational credit, it's really easy to claim yours. Uh, Listen to the podcast, which you are about to do, and then head over to the show notes for this episode at pediacastcme.org. This is episode 72. You'll find a link to the post-test in the show notes. Follow that link to Cloud CME, take and pass the post-test, and the Category 1 credit 
is yours. And by the way, we offer credit uh, to physicians, of course, but also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, and dentists. And since Nationwide Children's is jointly accredited by many professional organizations, it's likely we offer the exact credits you need to fulfill your state's continuing medical education requirements. Of course, you want to be sure the content of the episode matches your scope of practice. Complete details are available at pediacastcme. Org. We're also on social media. We love connecting with you there. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Uh, just search for PediaCast. And we have a contact link if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Uh, that contact link is over at PediaCastCME.org. And finally, I have to tell you that the information presented in every episode of our program is for general educational purposes only. We do not diagnose medical conditions or formulate treatment plans for specific individuals. Our discussion may contain only a portion of relevant information and should not be solely relied upon for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. We do not cover every possible treatment option, and the treatment options we do cover do not include every possible use, precaution, side effect, or interaction. Also, your use of this audio program is subject to the PediaCast CME Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at PediaCastCME.org. So let's take a quick break. We'll get Dr. Stukas connected to the studio, and then we will be back to talk about food allergies. It's coming up right after this. Dr. David Stukas is a pediatric allergist at Nationwide Children's Hospital and a professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. He also serves as director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center at Nationwide Children's, and he's a friend of this podcast, sharing his expertise on all things related to allergy and immunology many times since the beginning of this program, which makes him the perfect guest for walking us through a food allergy update. Uh, however, before we begin that journey, let's give a warm welcome back to our good friend, Dr. Dave Stukas. Uh, thank you so much for being here again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is going to be great. Yeah, I am really looking forward to it as well. Uh, before we start talking about food allergies, um, I did want to plug the podcast that you host called Conversations from the World of Allergy. Uh, it's the official podcast from the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology. And we'll put a link to it in the show notes for this program so folks can find it easily. But t tell us a little bit uh, about that podcast. Yeah, I couldn't let you have all the fun. So, uh, no, I, I was uh, hired by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology to be their social media editor, oh my gosh, three years ago, three and a half years ago. And um, we decided to start a podcast. So I think we have almost uh, 70 episodes now. Uh, and we interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology on you know hot topics. We've had a lot of podcasts focused around COVID, allergy-related information, new research. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate you mentioning it. And I have a lot of fun doing it just like you do as well. Yeah. And we'll put a link again in the show notes so folks can, can find it easily. So food allergies, um, let's just start with a baseline definition of what we consider to be a food allergy, because there are a lot of different reactions that you could get from food. But what constitutes a food allergy versus just some other thing associated with food? Yeah, I, I love the starting point because it really does matter. And when I think of the word allergy, it, it's quite simple. It's cause and effect because allergies are caused by the immune system. So exposure to an allergen, whether it's a food or inhalant allergen, should cause reproducible symptoms every single time your body sees that allergen. And those symptoms can vary based upon what type of allergy it is. And over time, we can talk about all that. But at its essence, an allergy and a food allergy is is an immune-mediated reproducible response that occurs every time you ingest a food. Yeah. So if a baby um, has spit-ups and vomits their formula, uh, that's not an allergy, right? That's more of a mechanical problem. There's not an immune system reaction typically that's helping with, with that sort of thing, right? That's correct. And there's a lot of symptoms that occur during food allergy reactions that can occur for a variety of other reasons, such as vomiting or rashes or you know changes to the stool and things like that. So we always want to be very careful about who we diagnose with food allergy and why. 
Yeah. And lactose intolerance, that's also not a food allergy, right? Right. No, intolerances are, are um, you know, can occur as well. This is a non-immunologic response to foods, and this is more difficulty of digestion. Uh, so this does not involve the immune system in any way. This is really the body having difficulty digesting things. Lactose intolerance is the most common example, as you and your listeners are aware. This is when people lack the ability to digest the simple sugar lactose, which is present in dairy products. So you eat a bunch of dairy that has lactose, you can't digest it. It passes through your intestines undigested, and it, it basically sucks water into the bowel, which is quite uncomfortable. So you get some cramping and some bloating and things like that. Uh, with intolerances, they often tend to come and go over time, or they uh, they may go away completely, or they may change based upon you know what you eat. So a lot of people say, I can't drink cow's milk because it gives me upset stomach if they have lactose intolerance, but they can have small amounts of cheese or milk as an ingredient in certain foods, whereas if you're allergic to it, you really shouldn't be able to eat it. In any form. Yeah. And so uh, the bottom line is to be a food allergy, the immune system is uh, in action and doing something in response to the food, looking at, at it as an allergen, uh, just like an allergy anywhere else in the body. If you have uh, asthma or allergic rhinitis or uh, uh, atopic dermatitis, it's the same sort of thing. It's just happening in the intestinal tract. That's right. Yeah. And the allergy antibody is called immunoglobulin E, I G E. Uh, if anybody's interested, we, we developed IgE as humans to fight off parasitic infections. So it was actually quite protective against parasites. And then as we move towards more cleaner environments, uh, we, we lack the need to fight off parasites so much. And IgE got bored, I like to say, and then started to react into things that shouldn't cause a problem in our world, such as ragweed pollen or peanut. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's really quite annoying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they they wanted a job. They were just, <laughs> yes, <laughs> they didn't want yes. to just hang out doing nothing anymore. They, I they love felt, that. They felt left out and now they're, uh, they're behaving very poorly. <laughs> yes. And so then that actually is a nice segue into how common uh, food allergies are and uh, who is affected by them. Because obviously they're more common now than they were when we were fighting off parasites, I would imagine. Yes, they are. Yeah. So uh, about five to eight percent of people have um, an IgE mediated food allergy or even a non IgE food allergy, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, I'm sure. Uh, so it's it's relatively common. Uh, it's about one in uh, one child in every classroom in every school in America on average. If you but just look at the averages that go across the board. Um, and uh, we know that there are some at higher risk to develop food allergies, especially those infants that come out uh, from allergic families or they have uh, pretty significant atopic dermatitis early in infancy that's you know pretty persistent. Those are the ones at highest risk to develop these food allergies. Yeah. Do we see any difference um, between demographic kind of information? Like, is there any difference between males and females or particular races or ethnic groups or geographic locations? Yeah, boy, boys in general, males in general are more affected by allergic conditions across the board at a younger age um, by about three to one margin just for all types of allergies uh, compared to females. And then that ratio flips during adolescence. There's there's things we don't fully understand when it comes to the immune system and, and all the, the hormones that circulate during adolescence. Uh, and then we do see food allergies affecting uh, different races more. So we know that minority populations, such as the African American population, have higher rates of food allergy uh, and, and allergic conditions in general. And then, interestingly enough, there's there's really interesting studies looking at um, uh, exposure to uh, UV light and vitamin D levels. And we know that you know food allergies are much more common in places like Australia uh, for reasons we don't fully understand. And you know, uh, depending upon your relationship to the equator, there may be higher rates of food allergy in certain areas where we may not see them at all in places like third world countries because uh, they their immune systems may be busy fighting off actual infection and, and they don't actually become hypersensitive to the environment or to foods. Mm -hmm. Very very interesting. Uh, what about uh, genetics? Do, do food allergies run in families or is it not related to genetics at all? It's really important for people to understand that specific allergies are not inherited. I will pause for dramatic effect because some people are going to say, what's that now? So you don't pass on venom allergy or penicillin allergy or peanut allergy. Allergy. However, the tendency to develop allergies is inherited. So there's a very strong uh, T helper type 2, Th2 cells for T cells. Uh, Th2 inflammation is often genetically inherited. And then there's very complicated early life interactions that we don't fully understand where exposure to certain things in the environment may then turn on or turn off certain transcription factors that then you know, helps promote uh, the development of these uh, Th2 inflammatory cytokines. So you you do see clusters, but that doesn't mean that it was inherited. Right. And then, you know, when I say this to some families, they say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me because I have a peanut allergy. My child has a peanut allergy. And I say, well, I believe you. And it's, it's bound to happen, statistically speaking, uh, because peanut is one of the more common causes of food allergy. And if you have a very allergic family and people have food allergies, it's just, you know, odds are that, you know, peanut will be one of them. 
Yeah. And then you kind of alluded to this, that there is a relationship between food allergies and other allergic diseases, such as we had mentioned allergic rhinitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis. So often you do see those kind of running in the same person. They can have multiple types of allergies in, in that sense. That's exactly right. We have, uh, it's called the atopic march or the allergic march. And generally what happens is uh, children come out uh, predisposed based upon family history uh, or not always family history, and they develop persistent atopic dermatitis. And this is more than just, you know, little tiny spot of eczema on the cheek that goes away with some moisturizer. This is, you know, truly persistent eczema that affects, you know, the the body and the extremities. And uh, despite doing daily skin moisturizer and things like that, those children are raising their hands to the world saying, pay attention to me. I'm the one who's going to go on to develop food allergies then environmental allergies, and then potentially asthma. Uh, And oftentimes eczema gets better as kids approach two or three years of age. They may or may not have developed food allergies by then. And then we see environmental allergies develop, you know, for indoor allergens such as uh, pet dander, cockroach, or dust mite, typically around 12 to 15 months of age is when we start to see the onset of that, but it can occur anytime thereafter. And then we don't really typically see seasonal allergies develop until about three or four years of age, just because you have to be exposed for a couple of years before you can become allergic. Yeah. Um, We kind of jokingly said that there's probably more food allergies today than there were when our immune systems were fighting off more parasites. Uh, But it really is true that food allergies are on the rise, right? And and if that is true, why is that? Oh, this is the question that everybody asks. I don't have the answer for you, Dr. Patrick. So, (laughs) no, you're right. It is. We we know that food allergy prevalence has doubled over the last couple of decades. And now, is that because we're we're recognizing it more because of overuse of testing, uh, because it actually is more prevalent? It's all complicated. and, And the answer is yes to all of those. Um, you, the hygiene hypothesis has been shown across different continents, and this goes back to what we talked about earlier, as, as societies have moved from farming environments where babies and infants are exposed to farm animals, and more importantly, the feces from those animals, and you know this very diverse microbiota, um, those immune systems, as we go to cleaner environments and we're sterilizing everything, their immune systems are becoming more hyperreactive. Uh, so we are seeing a shift to developing more food allergies. So that, that definitely plays into it. Uh, we used to think that avoidance of foods would prevent uh, food allergies from developing. And it turns out that advice was completely wrong. Uh, and now we know through very you know, landmark trials, the LEAP trial, where they introduced peanut to infants less than a year of age and you know, to half the group that ate peanut consistently compared to the other half that avoided it until five years of age, there was a dramatic reduction uh, in the development of peanut allergy for those that ate it on an on a early basis and kept it in their diet continuously. So now we know that promoting it and by giving it early, that's the best way to promote tolerance. Uh, so no easy answer, but you know, one thing that I think it's really important is, as uh, medical professionals, please don't ever tell a mother that she she caused her child to develop food allergy because of what she ate when she was pregnant or breastfeeding. That's not the case at all. Uh, one, why would you even say that to somebody? They have enough guilt as is. But two, we can actually alleviate a lot of that guilt by just having a conversation and say, look, there's nothing you could have done that would have caused this or prevented it. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things going through my mind, and I know we're speaking primarily to uh, pediatric providers in this podcast, uh, you mentioned that we had um, the recommendation to avoid peanut products for a long time until this new study uh, came out and new data comes out that shows it's actually better to introduce peanuts earlier. But you can use that as an example of something that parents know about because they've probably heard, hey, it's okay to introduce peanuts. It wasn't before. You know, they know a lot about food allergies. And then when we talk about like the pandemic stuff, you know, where recommendations seem to sometimes change every six months, it's the same thing, right? That we change our recommendations based on the current data. And as as new data comes out, it makes sense that recommendations would change. That's science. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that's a wonderful example. And that's something I discuss with families all the time. I say, yes, listen, I know we used to say this and we have to acknowledge it we have it's not right or wrong it's you know this was the information we had at the time and i tell families this you know we do the best that we can with the information we have available at, at the time information evolves our, our understanding evolves opinion changes and it's not right or wrong it is what it is and becoming more comfortable with how messy science can be is actually quite comforting knowing that there is not black or white it's not one size fits all we can change our approach yeah yeah absolutely uh, so let's talk about food allergies and the the pathophysiology or the mechanism behind them. Um, they can sort of be divided into the IgE mediated food allergies, which we've kind of been talking about, and then non IgE mediated food allergies. Um, let's begin with the IgE mediated ones. Um, kind of walk us through at the molecular level what is happening uh, step by step when there is an IgE mediated food allergy occurring. So when somebody has preformed specific IgE towards a food. 
uh, and then they eat that food, that food protein is exposed to the IgE uh, antibody, which sits on top of mast cells throughout all the tissues in our body, and it's also present on basophils, which are in the circulation. If that uh, key fits the lock, uh, then IgE opens up those cells and they release a bunch of different mediators. The first one that sits there as a, as a preformed mediator is called histamine. So histamine gets released typically within minutes, and then histamine can cause all kinds of symptoms throughout the body. And this is why we see rapid onset, especially itching. Uh, if histamine is in the upper respiratory symptom, we see nasal congestion, sneezing, runny nose. In the skin, it can cause flushing or hives, uh, plus lots of itching. In the gastrointestinal tract, it can cause nausea or vomiting or even some diarrhea. Uh, in the lower respiratory tract, it can cause bronchoconstriction, uh, and it can cause vasodilation as well. So that's why people can pass out when they have severe allergic reactions. So histamine is one of the main mediators. But then there's different signals that get released and all these different cytokines that say, hey, we're having an allergy party here. So you can see different types of interleukins released and, uh, you know, um, and different uh, cell mediators that come into play and, and can have more of a long, long-term effect. So when it comes to IgE, food allergy, it's pretty rapid in onset. It's going to happen within minutes of eating the food, rarely longer than two or three hours later. And it really should happen every time you eat the food because you can't fool the immune system. Yeah. Um, so there's really, you mentioned all of those different uh, systems and places where mast cells and basophils uh, exist. Um, really, you get a continuum then, a spectrum of, uh, of symptoms that can be different from one kid to another. Uh, we hear about anaphylaxis. At what point would we say that this is not just an, a regular food allergy, but now we actually have anaphylaxis? What, what differentiates that as an IgE-mediated response compared to just a normal food allergy? Anaphylaxis is a clinical de um, definition, so uh, diagnosis, I should say, and it's really when you have more than one organ system involved from an allergic reaction from anything, whether it's being stung by a venomous insect or eating a food. Uh, so anything, you know, skin counts as one, and skin is our largest organ, so you can be, you can look like a lobster head to toe, giant hives all over, but that's still just hives. Uh, but as soon as you combine that with nausea or vomiting, or you start to have persistent cough or wheeze because of bronchoconstriction or upper respiratory congestion, and you don't have to have skin symptoms, you know, 20% of anaphylaxis from food allergy doesn't have any skin symptoms at all. Uh, so the absence of it doesn't rule it out. But as soon as you have the combination of those two different organ systems, that's when we can define anaphylaxis. And I think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, people think about anaphylaxis, you go from zero to 60 miles per hour, all of a sudden your throat swollen shut and you die. That's not anaphylaxis anaphylaxis at all. There's a gradient. There's mild, moderate, severe anaphylaxis. I see anaphylaxis all the time in the office setting during our oral food challenges, and it's typically a few hives on the skin, and they throw up once. That's anaphylaxis, where they start to have persistent nasal congestion after feeding them a food we know they're allergic to. But the most important part of how do we diagnose this is the story. Was I just exposed, or was the person just exposed to something that they are known to be allergic to, or that could be a potential cause of allergy, and then did they have rapid onset progressive symptoms suggestive of allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. That's how we diagnose it. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to back up to, because um, among the providers who listen to this podcast, there are a lot of early career providers and medical trainees. And I think this is a really important point. Um, when you picture anaphylaxis, you know, you do, you think about hives, facial swelling, difficulty breathing, drooling, coughing, wheezing. Um, but I don't think it's drilled into you in your early education that a bellyache and vomiting are also considered part of anaphylaxis. And so if you do have a kid with hives who vomits once, like you said, that's anaphylaxis. And I think it's really important, you know, for the early providers realize that that part of the GI system is also part of this. Absolutely. Especially when the exposure comes through ingestion. And if you look at all the clinical criteria for how to diagnose it, it it's very clear if, you know, a, a, if exposure occurs through ingestion, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms are, are quite common. Um, um, and it makes sense, uh, whether it's a drug or a food or whatever it may be. Uh, and I think what you raise is a very important point of uh, we know that it's well established that anaphylaxis is, is not treated appropriately, even when they are, you know, have you have EMS arrive or when they're taken to the emergency room, there is a hesitancy to treat with epinephrine. Uh, we know about across the board, 50% of cases never get epinephrine. Now, thankfully, most of those people actually get better and anaphylaxis is generally self-resolved, but we also don't want to hesitate because it's very safe and effective treatment. So if, you, if you're not quite sure if it's the diagnosis or not, you're not going to cause much harm at all. And the benefit is extreme if you just treat with epinephrine uh, and observe for any, uh, any resolution symptoms. Yeah. So really important point here as we, as we transition to the treatment of anaphylaxis, and that is going to be first-line treatment is always going to be epinephrine, correct? 
That is absolutely correct. Epinephrine affects all of those organ systems I mentioned before. So regardless of where the symptoms are occurring, epinephrine will help reverse them. It can actually stop the release of additional mediators. It works extremely fast. We always want to give it intramuscularly in the outside part of the thigh where we have nice big blood vessels that can help circulate throughout the body. We don't need to give it in the deltoid. We shouldn't be giving it subcutaneously. Um, and especially when we're using the doses involved in auto injectors, uh, you know, these are very safe to give, you know, cardiac side effects everybody always worries about that you're not going to see that from a dose that we give through an auto injector it just doesn't occur we get we can get cardiac toxicity and, and some current some concerning side effects when we give boluses intravenously or when people are getting continuous epinephrine but don't hesitate to give it because it works really really fast and it works really well yeah and here's another point when uh where the um individual uh, primary care providers can make a huge difference uh, when i work in the emergency department we see anaphylaxis come in all the time and the parents had not given the, the epinephrine auto injector. They have it at home, but they were hesitant and they didn't use it. But if they had a primary care doctor who was telling them, you know, reinforcing, hey, it's okay to use this, use this. Yes, call 911, get them to the hospital, but use your auto injector right then and there when they have two organ systems involved. And I think more families would do it if their, uh, if their primary care physician really stressed that when they were doing the education about the treatment of anaphylaxis. Oh, I agree. And we know that there are misconceptions about epinephrine, so we can address that through anticipatory guidance. Uh, and you're absolutely right. There's a uh, phobia from the needle, uh, so we can even show them the needle or show them how small it is. It's less than a diameter of a dime. Um, we can talk and make it easy for them. So instead of saying somebody, well, if you're not really sure if you ate something, or if you're actually having this, let's go through the checklist of two or more organ systems. Just say, if it's anything more than hives, give epinephrine. And why would I say that? Because you know, it's true. It's going to work really fast. And even if you just had hives, epinephrine is going to make you feel a lot better um, very quickly. So we want to promote early use. The earlier it's used, the better it works. Thankfully, uh, food allergy related fatalities are quite rare. Uh, we, you know, we see about a dozen to 20 a year that we know of. Uh, but if you look across the board, there's one theme for almost all of these tragic cases is, is that they didn't get epinephrine uh, promptly or at all. Uh, so we can, we can try to address that as much as possible. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, mast cells release histamines, and we know that there's a category of medications called antihistamines. And so uh, when should they be used in uh, anaphylaxis and which antihistamines are the best ones to use? So first, you're going to give epinephrine. Then you're going to see if they get better. If they're not getting better, you're going to give epinephrine. If they're still not getting better, you're going to give epinephrine. If you're thinking about giving epinephrine, you're going to give epinephrine. <laughs> And then after you give epinephrine, you can observe and see how they're doing. <laughs> so if this is anaphylaxis, then there is a role for using antihistamines to help treat mostly some of the, the cutaneous symptoms and itch, um, and they can they can help with that. Now, we don't recommend using these old first-generation antihistamines such as diphenhydramine. Uh, we have so many better options now, and it, there's a lot of misconceptions. If you look at the second-generation non-sedating antihistamines such as cetirazine or fexofenadine, they actually work faster than the first-generation antihistamines. They last four times as long. They don't have near the side effects, and they're very safe to give even at young ages. Uh, but, you know, the first generations have been around for 80 years, so everybody's comfortable with them. Uh, it always baffles me that when somebody has a severe allergic reaction and you're, you're worried about their mental status and how they're doing, why on earth would we give them a sedating antihistamine that's going to zonk them out and we have no idea how they're, they're responding? So this is a huge culture shift. Uh, and then also there's very limited role for corticosteroids. Uh, they just don't work very quickly. They take hours before they have any, any benefit and the vast majority of people with anaphylaxis are resolved by then. We also now know through great meta-analyses and, and current guidelines that antihistamines and, and steroids do not prevent biphasic anaphylaxis from occurring. Uh, biphasic anaphylaxis is quite rare. It occurs less than one in 20 cases. And we can identify those that are at risk for it. So if somebody comes in and they require more than one dose of epinephrine, if they have severe respiratory compromise, or they have hypotension where they need intravenous boluses, those are the ones that really need to be monitored for longer periods of time in case their symptoms come back again. And biphasic would be, I have anaphylaxis, it resolves by itself or through treatment, I'm completely fine, and then symptoms come back again hours later. Um, and so that's biphasic, but thankfully it's quite rare. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'm really reinforcing the things that you say that are culture shifts. And uh, you mentioned that the diphenhydramine, and I suppose hydroxazine, you'd throw that in there as well as a first generation. First That's absolutely. Old. Chlorophenyramine. <laughs> okay, all, all of yeah. those. So, because we still see that a lot too. A lot of kids get diphenhydramine prescriptions. They're told to use it, but you would go more with like cetirizine, the this this the newer generation, the once a day uh, medicines are the ones that that you would recommend. 
I, I recommend that strongly, both for anaphylaxis and any condition for which you would treat with antihistamines. I would strongly consider that you make the switch to the non-sedating, just because we have better options. They work better. They have less side effects. Yeah. So just take diphenhydramine out of our toolbox. Ah, uh, yes. And actually, our colleagues in Canada are trying to remove it from uh, pharmacy shelves. Good. And and no steroids. Well, steroids, okay, especially if they're at risk for that biphasic, then maybe a steroid would be helpful. But this is not first line at all. Actually, a steroid isn't even helpful for biphasic. Um, you know what steroids do? They make the person prescribing them feel better about themselves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> As we think about treating anaphylaxis, uh, it's better to prevent it from happening in the first place. How can we do that? You know, if anybody is going to feel qualified enough to diagnose somebody with food allergy, you absolutely, this is imperative. You absolutely have to give them the right resources so they can manage this because this is a life altering condition. And if you don't give them the tools so that they understand avoidance measures and risk from various exposures, they're going to go online and they're going to read all the scary stories and they're going to adopt unnecessary restrictions that's going to absolutely negatively impact their lives. I meet these people all the time. They come to me as a second, third opinion, and they're, they have never traveled. They've never gone out to a restaurant, um, and they just take these severe restrictions. So management entails trying to avoid eating what you're allergic to. Uh, casual exposure in the environment poses minimal risk. Uh, mo- you know, Even if it touches the skin, the vast, vast majority of people won't have any symptoms at all, but they make it a little rash. You know, we worry about babies because they explore the environment with their hands and their mouths, so we want to be extra cautious in younger children. Airborne reactions to food particles are extremely rare. Uh, we hear about the scary stories on, on airlines. Almost all of these are actually panic attacks, um, so we need to counsel people. Uh, there are some limited examples such as aerosolization of milk protein during steaming milk or fish protein when you're frying it on the stove that can actually cause symptoms in people who are allergic oftentimes it's more lower respiratory symptoms or asthma but that's they have to prove that they have that they're at risk for that and then we talk about you know threshold amount because if you look at the the dose required for 50 percent of the people with peanut allergy to have any symptoms at all they have to eat almost a whole peanut uh, before they actually have a reaction. And that's very different than, you know, this culture of fear that has surrounded food allergy for the last 20 years of even trace amounts will kill you. That's not the case. Uh, there are some people exquisitely sensitive, but the vast majority of people are not. So we help people navigate this and say, listen, we want to communicate with food handlers. We want to read labels on packaged products to make sure we're not knowingly eating this. And we want to have our epinephrine available in case we do accidentally eat it. Uh, but otherwise, here are the, you know, the safe things that we can pursue. Uh, here are the things that are a little bit more risky. And then we want to help people give them those skills so they can manage this. Yeah, yeah, really important points. Um, the other thing is that parents really ought to be prepared for accidental reactions to really occur. I think I'd seen one number, half of all children diagnosed with a food allergy have an accidental reaction within 18 months. So, you know, parents shouldn't necessarily, I mean, you do your best to prevent it, but it's, you know, for half of people, it's still going to happen at some point. And so you're re- really going to want to be ready to act with the epinephrine auto injector at home. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this occurs across the board. Sometimes it's at home, sometimes it's at daycare, preschool, restaurants, things like that. So that's, you know, partly on, on what I do is every time I see them for follow-up visits and food allergy diagnosis really shouldn't be set it and forget it. It should be, let's revisit this every six to 12 months. Things can change. Uh, we need to repeat testing because we know that, you know, the, the vast majority of children with milk, egg, wheat, soy allergy outgrow by school age. We don't want them avoiding this the rest of their life, but they don't have to. Um, we just, we've learned so much about the individualized approach to food allergy management. Um, you know, anything, any conversation we had with families about food allergy three to five years ago is almost obsolete. Uh, Things have changed that dramatically. So uh, we need to get rid of the old mantras. We need to get rid of these overly restrictive, um, you know, regimens that we we prescribe or recommend for people. And we need to treat the person in front of us. Yeah. Um, We've we've been discussing um, IgE-mediated food allergies. There are also non-IgE-mediated food allergies. Uh, Talk us through how those develop. Yeah, so these are these are quite different. So this would not pose risk for anaphylaxis or for immediate onset reactions. And these are more difficult to diagnose because we often don't have good diagnostic tools. So the clinical history is really when we have to diagnose these. And, and what gets grouped into this are mostly gastrointestinal symptoms. So we have conditions such as food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, which often presents during infancy once they start eating solid foods. And the presentation is they eat something, and then this is delayed. So this is two to three hours later. They have intense repetitive vomiting, sometimes followed by diarrhea 
diarrhea. No hives, no anaphylaxis. This is T-cell mediated. Uh, some of the more common foods would be cow's milk or soy. But we also see it for traditionally non-allergenic foods like yellow vegetables uh, and poultry and things like that. So there's a whole host of foods that can do this in rice as well. Then we have the quote unquote cow's milk allergy that uh, gets often overdiagnosed and that the common presentation, and this would be cow's milk induced proctocolitis. You have that baby who's, you know, six to 12 weeks of age and they start to have painless gross red blood in their diaper. Uh, and then uh, this, you know, more often than not can be due to cow's milk protein from formula, uh, rarely from breast milk. We'll talk about that in a second. And then, you know, you take them off that. And the one thing I would advise people is don't play formula roulette. Um, give it 72 hours to resolve. It's not, you know, if the expectation is for parents that next diaper change, this should be gone, well, you're going to freak a lot of people out. So let them know it's going to take three days to heal because you have to let the, the, um, the distal part of the large intestine heal before you know you start to see resolution of that. Uh, and then there's other conditions like eosinophilic esophagitis, where uh, ingestion of foods may be contributing to that inflammation in the esophagus. Of course, we have celiac disease, which is technically an autoimmune condition, where the ingestion of gluten on a regular basis will cause an autoimmune response, and uh, the body attacks itself, and you can have all types of symptoms from that. So some of, those are some of the more common examples. Yeah. Um, what about the association of atopic dermatitis and food allergies? So specifically. Uh, if you have a kid with a milk allergy, for instance, can that make their their eczema worse? Yeah, this is an area where we really need to get away from old misconceptions because we're causing real harm for these babies and it's tragic. Uh, so eczema is not caused by food allergy. Uh, eczema is a chronic skin condition that we know there are uh, defects in the epidermis that leads to water loss and drying of the skin and barriers work both ways. So if the barrier is defective, then not only do you lose moisture, but then you get allergens and irritants that enter and you get chronic you know, irritation. The human mind is programmed to ask questions and seek answers to those questions. And more often than not, uh, families uh, will identify what is correlation as causation. So when you see eczema, which naturally waxes and wanes over time, families will almost always come in and say, I'm convinced it's because they ate this. Well, more often than not, it's coincidental with that, especially if a mother is breastfeeding. There's very little chance that anything that she's eating uh, remains as an intact food protein in her breast milk that's actually causing eczema. So we need to stop telling breastfeeding mothers to you know, eliminate foods from their diet based on eczema. And in fact, this is where we cause harm. We know, I mentioned before the atopic march, that kids with eczema are more likely to develop allergies. They're also more likely to develop IgE, um, but not actually be allergic. So the presence of IgE through a skin prick test or a blood test only shows you sensitization. That is not allergy. It's not a pregnancy test. It's not yes or no. And if, we, if kids with eczema are more likely to, to develop IgE, if we do a bunch of food IgE tests on them, we're going to get tons of false positive results. Now we know if, if, if an infant is eating a food and not having rapid onset high swelling IgE reactions, and they do IgE testing, and then they're told to take that food out of their diet based upon the test, that's how we cause food allergy to develop. And this is tragic because this is on us. We all took oaths to do no harm. And we're actually causing harm by, by telling somebody who is tolerant but sensitized to stop eating a food. And then if they go a period of weeks to months and they try to eat the food again, they could develop an allergic reaction. So again, this is an, an important enough point that I want to revisit it and restate it maybe in a, in a different way. Uh, so if you do, uh, if you're worried about uh, diagnosing food allergies, which we're going to get to diagnosis here in, in a moment. But since you brought this up, I'm going to mention it. Uh, if you test for IgE to specific foods in the blood, then that means that they have been sensitized to it. So maybe they're a child with atopic dermatitis and they got some of it on their skin, you know, some of the food protein on their skin, and then they made IgE against it. But that does not mean that then that they're going to have an allergic reaction if they eat that. Uh, you can only tell that if you if they sh if they do that clinically, right? That's absolutely right. So the only yeah. So do you want to shift the diagnosis now, or do you want to just yeah yeah, yeah. yeah right. go ahead Let's okay go. all right so. Let me give you the statistic. 40% of all children will develop IgE, or you can measure this in their blood, to milk, um, shrimp, peanut, or egg. But only 5% are actually allergic to those foods. So if we rely on testing alone, we're going to overdiagnose the vast majority of people with food allergy. The best give us those I'm sorry, do those percentages yeah. again. So 40% of children are sensitized, meaning you can find IgE to a major food allergen, but only 5% are actually allergic. So if we tested everybody, these are not screening tests. I can't emphasize that enough. These don't meet any criteria that we would use for a good screening test. And they absolutely cause harm by overdiagnosis, unnecessary avoidance. And as I mentioned before, if somebody's eating it, 
but they're tolerant, not having symptoms, and they have IgE, we absolutely need to keep it in their diet. You tell them to stop eating it, and then you can develop allergy that way. And we see this all the time, and it really is heartbreaking. Yeah. So, so if you're a pro- if you're a provider out there. And you you routinely order uh, food allergy panels, blood panels. Please stop. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. One is that at our institution, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we removed these panels from our laboratory uh, three years ago, two years ago, um, because of the harm that they cause. You can absolutely still order specific IgEs to foods. You just have to think about what foods you want to test for. Because, uh, you know, you have somebody comes in and you're worried about milk allergy, all of a sudden you get test results back for egg, wheat, banana, pea, peanut, and you have no idea what to do with it. Um, and then the second thing is if nobody's familiar, if you're not familiar with the Choosing Wisely series, I recommend you, you look at this. Choosing Wisely was started, oh my gosh, 20 years ago by the American Board of Internal Medicine. They partner with 60 subspecialties. If you look at the, the list, it's basically a list of things that are being overused in regards to diagnosis and or treatment. There's 10 things on the list of, of the specialty of allergy and immunology. Number one on the list, literally the worst thing we're doing in allergy and immunology. Number one, don't ever order a large panel of IgE tests and evaluation of food allergy. It also includes IgG tests, which are these food sensitivity tests, which are complete garbage. We'll talk about that later. Um, All right. So with that, food allergies are diagnosed by the history. So what happens when you eat a food? If you're eating a food and you're not having symptoms suggestive of food allergy, you're not allergic to that food. If you've never eaten a food, I don't know if you're allergic to that food. The symptoms matter. The timing of onset matters. It should be within an hour or two of eating it. So it's not going to be hives that have lasted for three days because food allergy reactions are gone within an hour or within a couple of hours. Um, And it's also not going to be something they ate something today and they woke up the next day and they had these symptoms. We also need to understand that hives and all the symptoms that occur with food allergies can absolutely occur for other reasons. So patients and parents have to prove to us that they're allergic by giving us a good story. Hey, Dave, every time my child, you know, we tried peanut butter on three occasions and every time they broke out in hives or they had vomiting, you have my full attention. I'm worried that when my child eats strawberries three days later, their left toe gets itchy. I believe you and I hear you, but I'm not worried about food allergy. So just because they come in with concerns for food allergy does not mean we are obligated to test them for that. At our new food allergy center, um, we have undiagnosed food allergy at 50% of all of our new patient visits. That means people come in legitimately thinking their child has a food allergy and half the time we're just, we're explaining to them why they're not actually allergic. It's because of all this overlap that we see with all these other symptoms. So we start with a story and I'll let you, I'll let you kind of follow up here and then we'll talk about testing in a second. Yeah. Well, you mentioned hives and I think that all pediatric providers need to understand that the number one cause of hives in kids are viral illnesses. And so, uh, you know, if you have a kid who maybe ate something new and as you said, you know, then that evening and it was, you know, several hours later, they get hives, but they also have a little runny nose or they had a runny nose a couple of days ago. Uh, that's one thing, but if they eat something and 10 minutes later, they have hives and then, and maybe vomit. And perhaps they, you notice that they did that two months ago and they did it again today with that kind of timing, that's significant. Absolutely. So as I mentioned at the start, allergies are reproducible. So if it comes and goes over time with what you're eating, that's not allergy. If they come in and they have no idea what caused it, that's not allergy. If they come in thinking that it's 25 different foods that they're all of a sudden allergic to, that's not allergy. Um, if, If I can do anything I possibly can to help pediatricians and all medical professionals become comfortable with hives, boy, that would be that would be amazing because hives are not dangerous. Hives are hives. Hives are annoying. Hives are itchy. But hives freak everybody out. Uh, especially parents. So we need to help promote calm when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, so we talked to blood tests. Please don't use those. Uh, what about skin testing? What's the role of skin testing in the diagnosis of food allergies? Yeah. So if we're trying to detect IgE towards specific allergens, we can look at skin tests or blood tests. Um, these are valid at any age. And a lot of people will say, I heard you couldn't skin test until kids were four or five years of age. That's all nonsense. If you're old enough to develop IgE allergy, you're old enough to have a test that shows you have IgE allergy. They're often negative in young children because people are using IgE tests for non-IgE conditions. Uh, so, you know, they're not going to be valid for that. But with the skin testing, we do this in the office on a regular basis. We take drops of liquid allergen and we place it on the skin on the back or on the forearm. We gently scratch through the top layer of the skin. If that person has that Ig antibody bound to those mast cells, it will bind it and it will open up the mast cells and release histamine, which causes a hive. And then the size of the hive only indicates the likelihood that allergy is present. Um, and when it comes to blood testing, we can measure levels of Ig in the blood and you get a range from essentially 0.1 up to 100. Just like a skin test, the size of the blood test helps indicate the likelihood that allergy is present. Neither skin nor blood tests are screening tests. You can't just test for whatever you want and see what comes back. It's not a positive or negative result. 
Neither of the skin or blood tests will also indicate the severity of, of the allergy as well. Uh, we currently don't have any tests that help indicate severity. Unless somebody has actually had anaphylaxis in the past, we don't know if they're going to have anaphylaxis in the future. So we want to avoid overuse of these tests. We want to interpret them in the proper context. Um, and we want to make sure that you know we're not you know causing undue harm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about, uh, you mentioned the food challenge. Uh, what role does an oral food challenge play in uh, the diagnosis of food allergies? How, how do you do that? Oral food challenge is the most valuable tool that we have to help diagnose food allergy or determine if prior food allergy has since resolved. This is the gold standard test, but it's very time intensive. Uh, what this involves is, you know, families come hang out with us for you know half a day. We usually start first thing in the morning or in the afternoon, and then we give them gradually increasing amounts of food. And we take breaks about 10 minutes in between each dose, trying to get them to eat about a serving or so. And then if they eat a full serving and nothing happens, it's, it's likely that they're not actually allergic to it. Um, we do about 700 of these food challenges a year at our institution, and it is extremely valuable. And even when symptoms occur, it changes their life because they say, oh, now I know that I am allergic for sure. They get a better sense of how much did I need to eat before any symptoms occurred, and they actually see what symptoms occurred. Even when anaphylaxis occurs, which we have about 10% of the time, um, and we give epinephrine, we actually have parents give it. And while there's tears and it's very you know, very stressful at the time, afterwards, every single one of them says, I'm so glad I went through that because now I know what to observe. Now I know that I can do it. Now I see how fast it works. Yeah, yeah. I imagine that's life-changing for so so many people to actually walk through that themselves and have it happen in a controlled setting and then you would feel more comfortable with it if it when it does happen when you're either home or out and about. Uh, one other aspect of uh, food allergy diagnosis that I've been reading about is something called component testing. Uh, where you, so there, instead of the whole food um, allergen, you're looking at specific proteins or something. What, what is that all about? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we know, let's say peanut, for example. Um, when we do skin testing or traditional blood testing, we're just looking at an amalgam of all the different antigens involved in that. But there's really several different antigens that can cause an allergic reaction. We also know that there's some that actually just show sensitization, but not allergy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the pollen that causes allergy and the foods that we eat. And with peanut, uh, it very much looks like birch tree pollen. So there's a lot of people out there that have itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, runny nose in the springtime because they're allergic to birch tree. And if you do enough peanut testing on them, it's going to come back positive, but they're not actually allergic to peanut. So the component testing helps tease out which antigens are more likely to be associated with a clinical uh, food allergy reaction versus just sensitization. They also don't show severity. And the way they're reported, it's reported as something like, uh, based upon this result, you're, this patient is more likely to have anaphylaxis. That's actually not true. And there's no cutoff level. So that's another thing for all blood tests. There's no level that says yes or no, you are allergic. So we don't even know what these tests mean on a population level. We still don't really fully understand what percentage of people have numbers in their blood to the antigens associated with, with clinical allergy that can actually eat it without problems. So uh, they have a role to play, uh, but it is a limited one. Okay. Um, let's before we move to allergy uh, food allergy management, um, let's talk through what foods are most commonly associated with food allergies because there aren't as many as people would think, right? No, that's absolutely right. So um, more than ninety percent of all IgE food allergy reactions are caused by nine foods: cow's milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish, as well as sesame. Uh, so those foods account for the vast majority of all food allergy reactions. Now, any food can potentially cause a food allergy reaction, uh, but it's much less likely when we start talking about fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, lean meats and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, you know, people tend to think that strawberries are a common cause of allergy. I don't think I've diagnosed legitimate strawberry allergy in 15 years, um, but we know that there are many foods that can cause a non-allergic irritation of the skin, uh, either by eating it or touching the skin, and strawberries are at the top of the list, but so are tomato-based foods and sauces and dressings, and ranch dressing notoriously causes these red rashes around the mouth, cinnamon, bananas. Uh, I mean, there's like 200 different things that can do this. So just because people have symptoms after eating a food, it doesn't necessarily mean they're allergic. Yep. Because that's not not IgE mediated, right? So there's no risk of anaphylaxis with what you just described. That's correct. So th the typical story is, um, you know, uh, it's a, a fair skinned child or toddler, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, or, you know, very fair skin. And oftentimes parents look just like them as well. And the story is they get redness on their face when they eat. 
uh, and oftentimes it's from purees or sauces and they have no other symptoms. The question I like to ask families now is how do they behave? Because children having a food allergy reaction generally don't feel very well, so they're going to be irritable and fussy, whereas these these children who have non-allergic contact rashes, they're happy as a clam and they're just playing and fun and parents look at them and they say, oh my gosh, why is their face so red? Uh, so that is much more reassuring that this is not a true food allergy, especially because the foods that they list of concern are things like you know sweet and sour sauce and ranch dressing and strawberries, which we know aren't very allergenic. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some groups, so tree nuts and shellfish uh, and, and fish. Uh, are you likely to just be allergic to one kind of tree nut or one type of shellfish, or are you allergic to all of them? Yeah, the cross-reactivity changes. So when it comes to tree nut, we used to tell people not that long ago, if you have a peanut allergy, avoid all tree nuts as well, just to be on the safe side. That is outdated. Uh, tree nuts are different from peanuts. The only thing they share in common from an allergy standpoint are the letters L. N, U, and T, uh, but peanuts are legumes and grow on the ground. And we know with tree nuts, there are some that cross-react with each other more than others. So walnut and pecan look very similar to the immune system. Cashews and pistachios look very similar. Uh, very few people have almond allergy, even if they're allergic to other tree nuts. So we can tease that out with tree nuts. And it's so much easier now with all the variety of products available at some of the, the stores out there and, and online. So we really want to help families navigate that. Unfortunately, when it comes to shellfish, like um, shrimp, crab, and lobster, there's very strong cross-reactivity. So most people need to avoid all types of crustaceans, but that's very different than fin fish, like salmon and tuna and tilapia. So there's many people out there that can you know, uh, tolerate fin fish, but they react when they eat shellfish. Yeah. And fish in the diet can, can certainly be healthy. And so this would be an area where you might want to visit a food allergy clinic to really tease out what specific uh, is, it, is it all shellfish or is it also fin fish? And, you know, so you can figure out what you can eat because fish is a healthy part of our diet. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of families that have a very strong cultural uh, identity as well. And uh, there, you know, there can be significant disappointment if they're told they can't eat certain groups of foods uh, because it is just a strong part of their lifestyle. So we can help people figure this out. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when you see kids with food allergies, do most of them only have an allergy to one specific food or do you see uh, one kid being allergic to lots of different things? Well, it, it can be, it can vary. Um, there's, there are children that are just highly allergic and they typically have the terrible eggs and then they they can have multiple food allergies, uh, whereas others are only allergic to peanut and nothing else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the management then of food allergies. So you've you've diagnosed it. It really is a true allergy. Uh, there's the anaphylaxis. Let's say, uh, what do, what do you do for that? How do you manage? Other than I mean, avoidance obviously. And as we talk about prevention. Um, you want to avoid that food as much as possible. But is there anything that we can do to temper that allergy or to maybe even make folks be able to eat those foods again? Yeah, oral immunotherapy um, has been used in clinical practice for well over a decade. And then the first FDA-approved um, product therapy for peanut allergy uh, came on the market two years ago. This is called palforzia. This is for peanut allergy. Uh, but allergists have been using just regular food. And then palforzia is just peanut flour. It's not like it's a medication or anything like that. Um, but the concept behind oral immunotherapy is just what we've been doing with allergy shots for over 100 years. So we can expose the body to very small amounts uh, and then continue to expose it over time, which can raise the amount that you would need to be exposed to to cause symptoms. So we can desensitize. It's very important to understand that desensitization involves ongoing, continuous daily ingestion of a food under very close supervision. Um, whereas what we're trying to find is sustained tolerance, which means I don't have to eat it consistently and then I can eat it whenever I want and not have a reaction or essentially a cure. Unfortunately, with oral immunotherapy, we can desensitize about 60 to 80% of kids. Not everybody can do it because they're having reactions and, and adverse effects and things like that. But to use this as a cure, it's very unlikely. So the vast majority of people are never able to stop eating their food and then you know eat it whenever they want or ad lib. Oral immunotherapy requires in-office visits about every two weeks where updosing occurs to try to increase the amount that they're going to eat. Then families go home and they continue to give their child that dose every single day. Uh, it can be, you know, it's, it's important people understand the risks, benefits, and expected outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation floating around on social media in regards to, you know, people being cured of their food allergies. And unfortunately, that's not the case for the vast majority of people. The risks involved are what happens if we take somebody with a known food allergy and we give them what they're allergic to every day to eat. Well, we can cause an allergic reaction. And we have ways of controlling for that, which is why we go very, very slowly under supervision. But we need to control their comorbid conditions as well, especially asthma. 
because uh, that can pose at risk for having a more severe reaction. People need to uh, not exercise for about two hours after taking their dose every day, which is really hard if somebody's playing competitive soccer and they practice every day of their traveling. So it may not fit in for some lifestyles. And then, you know, less than 5% can develop more long-term gastrointestinal problems like eosinophilic esophagitis and things like that. Uh, so we want to make sure people are understanding of what the daily regimen involves as well as the risks. And they also need to know this is for the long haul. So, you know, this is for years and years and years and potentially lifelong of continual exposure. Uh, you may not be able to eat as much as you want. You still need to have your epinephrine available. But for families, especially those children that are exquisitely sensitive and had very severe reactions from eating very small amounts, this can give them a buffer where they would need to increase the amount they need to eat to cause a severe allergic reaction. Or for those families that are simply highly anxious um, and they're, they're fearful of sending their child to school or travel or things like that, this can give them that confidence they need as well. Uh, so there's a lot to it. Uh, it's not an, an easy thing. Uh, it's not an easy fix, but uh, you know, allergists are, are here to help and uh, we can guide people through this decision-making process. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, a, an area really where you should refer your kids to see a, a pediatric allergist um, as opposed to trying to do this yourself in your office. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, uh, you know, say that we are corner the market on this, but I agree with you that, you know, we have, you really need a, a very good understanding of uh, the immune system and food allergy management. You need to have the ability to monitor for food allergy reactions in your office and treat them during the updosing. Uh, you need to counsel families about all the risks involved and, and as well as the benefits and you need to monitor them long-term. And, and in my experience, you know, that, that's why we're here. That's what we do as allergists. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of nuance uh, that's that's involved in really individualizing it from family to family, and the amount of time that that you spend with each patient, I'm sure, is much more than uh, primary care folks are are afforded. Um, when you know, so that then you can talk through these things and do a lot more anticipatory guidance. But you know, everybody's office practice is set up a little different, so mm -hmm. it's possible. But we'd highly recommend uh, uh, referring to your your friendly uh, neighborhood pediatric allergist. Yeah, well, um, what, if I may, let me put it this way. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah. there are many allergists that, that their clinical practice is not well suited to start oral immunotherapy. There's a lot entailed on our end uh, to be able to support these families as well and make sure that we're doing it the right way. Yeah. Um, we talk about oral immunotherapy. Uh, there was a product out for a while, and maybe it's still out there, called a peanut patch. Okay, so can you expose transdermally? Yes. The, the um, antigen? Right. So uh, this is not actually available. So it went under the, it went up for approval uh, to the FDA. But the, the patch they used needed to be adjusted because it wasn't sticking on the skin for as long as the FDA had wanted it to. But the research shows that this can work uh, very similar ways. Uh, basically, you, expo you expose very small micro doses of peanut antigen to, through the skin, uh, where it is then you know, taken into the body. And over time, over you know two to three years, you can actually then increase the amount that person would need to eat to cause any reaction at all. Uh, with very few side effects, mostly just skin rash where it occurs and you kind of rotate the site. So that's very promising and hopefully will be available soon. Uh, and then there's also approaches looking at sublingual immunotherapy, which is just putting some amount of liquid allergen under the tongue and absorbing it through the oral mucosa. That doesn't provide near as much benefit as the oral immunotherapy. So if you eat it and digest it, it's a much higher tolerance you can get, uh, but there's less side effects. So there, there's a whole host of ways that people are looking at to desensitize. Great. Um, let's talk about the introduction of food uh, to babies. And, you know, when I trained, it was at four months, you start the cereals and then you add the, uh, you add vegetables and then you add fruits and then you try the meats last uh, and you don't do any peanuts uh, until at least 12 months of, of age. Uh, it's all changed. So kind of walk us through what primary care providers should be instructing their families in terms of the proper way to introduce foods to infants. Yeah, the current evidence-based guidelines based upon not only the LEAP trial, but other um, large randomized clinical trials are all demonstrate that the earlier we introduce allergenic foods to infants beginning around four to six months of age or whenever they're ready to eat solids, and this is the important part, and keep it in the diet on a consistent basis, that is the best path we have, collectively speaking, to prevent the development of food allergy. It's not 100% effective. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of work involved in trying to get this message across to families. But as pediatricians, boy, it would sure would be great if you made this a part of your anticipatory guidance at every well visit from birth, you know, through the early stages of feeding. There's a window of opportunity here. We really want to get these foods in the diet prior to eight or nine months of age if possible. But it's never too late to try. So if they haven't done it, we still want to feed it. Um, but I, you know, the other thing we have to acknowledge here is that we've done such a great job of just scaring the hell out of parents of feeding their babies over the last 20 years that this legitimately causes concern for families. Uh, so we need to undo that and address it. Uh, you know, risk, you can think about it in different ways. We've talked about how about 5% of children will develop food allergies. 
that means 95% of children will never develop food allergies, regardless of how you feed them or what you do for them. So if we're telling 100% of parents that their kids are ticking time bombs, we're sending a very negative message. Um, so we need to you know, I support these families, especially those infants that have persistent eczema. Those are the ones we want to pull those families aside and spend time with them and say, this is the benefit. We can truly change this child's life if we can get you to overcome this concern you have and, and get food in their diet and keep in their diet on a consistent basis. So uh, breast milk is best or infant formula until four to six months of age. And then anything that is not a choke hazard, uh, you could start introducing, but you probably do want to introduce things. I mean, not like a, about 10 things in, <laughs> in a two day period, you know, you go kind of slow with it and, uh, and then, and see what happens. Well, actually there's no evidence to support that either. So um, oh. one new food every three, four, five, six, seven, eight days. I asked some of the top dietitians in the world, what's the evidence to support that and they can't even agree with each other it's all made up um, and it makes sense why people would say that because if something were to happen then parents can tease out which food caused it but again if 95 percent of children will never have any food allergic reactions uh, you know what's the harm in telling them to try 12 new foods all at once and then if something happens then we can tease it out on the back end uh, so it's just different approaches to to the same issue here but um, you know every family is a little bit different how they respond some do like that prescriptive behavior about feeding their kids. But I'm I'm all for, you know, not medicalizing the way we feed babies. Just let the babies eat. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love that you call me out on, uh, <laughs> on non-evidence-based things because we pride ourselves on being evidence-based. And so I love that. Um, so how about peanuts uh, specifically? Like how do we introduce a peanut to babies? Because obviously that would be a choking hazard. We can't put yeah. a peanut in a baby's mouth. So uh, how do we, uh, when is it safe to introduce, you know, what in what circumstances might you be hesitant about doing it? And then if you are going to introduce peanut, what's the best way to, to get that protein in them? Yeah. In the United States in 2017, and I was part of this, this expert panel, we, we wrote addendum guidelines. In the United States, it is advised for children with persistent, severe eczema, not just that little spot, but they really have you know, a large part of the body surface area covered or you're using prescription strength steroids and it's, it just keeps coming back. Um, the United States advises doing a peanut skin test or blood test prior to introduction, not to diagnose peanut allergy, but to figure out the best way to introduce it to them, whether it's at home, if they don't have any sensitization or in the office, if they are sensitized. I, I can say that things have changed. That was five years ago. There are many other countries that don't employ the, the testing prior to introduction. There's a lot of, you know, this leads to lag time and, you know, seeing the specialist or having the test done or interpreted properly. It may lead to unnecessary avoidance by people saying you can't do it because your kid's already allergic. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, risk to it as well. Uh, and other countries like Australia, it's just a population wide. Let every baby eat peanut and they're doing quite well. There's a, a misconception that infants are going to die the first time they eat peanut. Um, you know, when kids have, I don't get patients because they die when they have reactions. I get patients because they get some hives that they throw up and the parents say, that's not right. I need to investigate this. Um, so we can counsel families about that. And then when you, when you start to get peanuts, really, you know, start when kids have already shown babies, I should say, have shown the ability and interest to, to chew and swallow solid foods. So the typical, you know, cereals and purees and things like that, as you mentioned, we want to avoid whole or partial nuts until they're at least four or five years of age due to the choking risk. But you can give peanut butter that's thinned uh, with some water. Water. You can use peanut flour, or peanut powder, and mix it into cereals and purees. Or there are these um, peanut puffs like Cheetos that are called Bomba. Uh, and this is actually what started the whole uh, peanut allergy uh, introduction. And they, they've been feeding this to babies in Israel for quite some time. So uh, they're now widely available in America as well. Great. Perfect. Um, what other things are on the horizon now in terms of uh, food allergy research? Like what, what do we still need to learn? Yeah, there's a lot of focus on the microbiome. So the, the trillions of bacteria that live on us and in us, and we know that there's, there's differences in children who have allergies and food allergies with their microbiome compared to kids who don't. What do we do about that? We still have no idea, uh, but there's really interesting research looking at ways to manipulate the microbiome with either probiotics or even fecal transplants. Uh, that's actually going on. Uh, promising areas, the use of biologics, you know, we've use biologics for severe asthma for almost 15 years and now we have them available for asthma for you know chronic urticaria for nasal polyps for atopic dermatitis and biologics target specific parts of the immune system so there's investigations looking at um, anti-IgE monoclonal antibodies and if that can protect children against food allergy reactions um, and then there's you know new ways of diagnosing it so there's there's ways instead of just the skin prick test or blood testing can we actually take the allergen and, and incubate it with a person's blood cells their fresh blood and see if we can then uh, measure the release of these 
allergic mediators. So the basic activation test is looking very promising in regards to, you know, can we actually determine clinical allergy versus sensitization? Uh, so those are some of just some of the areas right now, but uh, it, it's, it's an exciting time in the food allergy world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's two specialty clinics that uh, the allergy and immunology folks at Nationwide Children's Hospital runs. Uh, one of them is the Food Allergy Treatment Center, and you are the uh, director of that. And then there's also an early peanut intervention clinic. Uh, tell us about those two programs. Yeah, we our, our hospital fully supported us in developing a, a standalone food allergy treatment center, which we it's you know our all of our allergists are part of the group, the center, but we we have a physical location which is about 20 miles north of our main campus at the, the Lewis Center facility. And there's an emergency room right there on the first floor, up on the second floor. Uh, and we see patients three days a week. And we built this center really to provide comprehensive services to all families, starting from diagnosis through management and beyond. Uh, we can offer, you know, tons of food challenges. We have the support to spend, you know, all the time that we that we need to with families to tease out important differences between food allergy or intolerance or, or things that are completely unrelated to allergy. We actually now have a psychologist that comes up there once a week, or we have a, we also have a nice referral base with them because of the extreme anxiety that can uh, affect these families as well. Uh, and then we're launching our clinical research trials. We actually um, are, have our first trial that we're starting now, and we're, enrollment is open, and we're uh, talking about starting our second one. So having this physical space allows us to do all of these things uh, in addition to all the advocacy efforts that we do in our community and beyond. And then the peanut introduction clinic that you mentioned, we started that uh, right when the U.S. uh, changed their guidelines as a way to help facilitate um, easy access to get in to see us. We don't want these families waiting months and months and months. So if they get referred specifically for peanut testing and introduction, they have to have uh, moderate to severe persistent atopic dermatitis. Uh, and then we get them all in. We actually batch them uh, one half day every month and we see them all. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then based upon the skin testing, we just feed peanut butter right there in the office. And um, every baby makes the exact same face. They kind of take their first little lick off the spoon. They gum, they make a gumming sound. Um, and then they kind of lean in and their eyes get real wide because they want more. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that is great. I would have trouble not eating some of the peanut butter myself. Well, we have, I mean, we have stashes. We have all kinds of stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a common occurrence. Yeah. I, I guess so. <laughs> um, so we are going to put links in the show notes uh, for this episode 72 over at pediacascme.org uh, to both the Food Allergy Treatment Center and the Early Peanut uh, Intervention Clinic, and also to the the uh, Division of Allergy and Immunology in general, because you guys do a lot more than just food allergies, right? What, what else do you guys take care of? Oh my gosh, yeah. We have uh, one of the largest pediatric divisions in the country. Uh, so any type of allergic condition, uh, you know, whether it's concern about drug allergy, environmental allergies, atopic dermatitis, venom allergy, uh, asthma. Uh, we have a complex asthma clinic that is specialized for children with difficult to control asthma. We have specialized clinics for children with eosinophilic esophagitis where we combine with our GI colleagues. Uh, we have a special drug allergy referral program. And then we are a Jeffrey Modell uh, Foundation Center for Primary Immune Deficiency. So comprehensive services for children who have issues with their immune system, whether it's primary or secondary immune deficiency. So we do it all. Uh, I love working here. Uh, we have a wonderful group uh, and uh, we want to do everything we possibly can to help support these families. Yeah, great. And again, we'll put links uh, to all your services in the show notes for this episode. Um, I also collected, um, because you guys actually, as as a division, um, write a lot of blog posts because I was going through our 700 children's blog and there's like, I, I found 17 articles related to food allergy. Wow. And uh, yeah, 17. Um, and uh, I put, I made, I curated a list of all 17 and uh, I'm going to put those in the show notes as well. And so for primary care providers out there, I mean, this is a treasure trove of information. I mean, you could easily, you know, the ones that you like the most uh, print them out and use them as handouts if you want. Um, and certainly, you know, links. We, we ought to talk to our social media folks about putting them all in a curated list some way so that folks could, you know, if you're interested wow. in food allergies, this is how we find all the articles. Uh, but just as some examples, um, anxiety in food allergies, which really looks at the mental health component of food allergies, uh, diagnosing food allergies with the component testing that we had talked about, uh, going back to school with food allergies, uh, tips for trick or treat, uh, trick or treating with food allergies, uh, peanut allergy myths versus facts. Um, there's one even our allergies caused by C-sections. Uh, I imagine the short answer to that is no, right? It's complicated. Oh, yes. <laughs> no. Oh. There's an association, association of mode of delivery with uh, future development of food allergy. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. See, I need to read that. Not, not causation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Gotcha. All right. Well, Dr. Dave Stukas, uh, Pediatric Allergies with Nationwide Children's Hospital, we always love it when you uh, stop by and visit us, and we thank you for doing it again today. Well, it's my pleasure, and thank you so much for not only having me as a guest, but for promoting all the work that we're doing as well. So, appreciate it. We are back with just enough time to say thanks once again to all of you for taking time out of your day and making PediaCast a part of it. Really do appreciate that. Also, thanks to our guest this week, Dr. Dave Stukas, pediatric allergist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Don't forget, you can find us wherever podcasts are found. We are in the Apple and Google podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. Our landing site is pediacastcme.org. You'll find our entire archive of past programs there, along with show notes, our CME information, our terms of use agreement, and that handy contact page if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Reviews are helpful wherever you get your podcasts. We always appreciate when you share your thoughts about the show. And we love connecting with you on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Simply search for PediaCast. So you've listened to the podcast. Now be sure to claim your free Category 1 Continuing Medical Education credit. It's really easy to do. Just head over to the show notes for this episode, a 72 over at PediaCastCME.org. You'll find a link to the post-test in the show notes. Follow that link to Cloud CME, take and pass the post-test, and the Category 1 credit is yours. Super easy, right? And again, we offer credit not only to physicians, but also nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, and dentists. Of course, you want to be sure the content of this episode matches your scope of practice. All the details are available over at pediacastcme.org. Also want to remind you about our podcast for parents, a plain pediacast without the CME. Lots of pediatricians and other providers also tune in as we cover pediatric news, answer listener questions, and interview pediatric and parenting experts. Shows are available at the landing site for that program, pediacast.org. Also available wherever podcasts are found. Simply search for PediaCast. Thanks again for stopping by. And until next time, this is Dr. Mike saying stay informed, keep it evidence-based, and take care of those kids. So long, everybody. This program is a production of Nationwide Children's. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on PediaCast. C-N-E.